Okay, I think we're ready to go. Thank you all for joining us for today's webinar, The Pow Chic Skipperling, Recovery Tales of a Tiny Butterfly. My name is Christine Chilton. I'm the Community Relations Manager at the Nature Conservancy of Canada here in Manitoba, and I'll be your moderator for today. I'd like to start by stating that we at the Nature Conservancy of Canada respectfully acknowledge the work we do across the country is on the traditional territories of many Indigenous communities, past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I would like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. The Nature Conservancy of Canada is a national charity and Canada's leading not-for-profit private land conservation organization, working to protect our most important natural areas and the species they sustain. Since 1962, NCC and its partners have helped to protect 14 million hectares, which is 35 million acres, coast to coast to coast. To learn more, please visit our website at www.natureconservancy.ca. We'll be joined today by Sarah Warner, Environmental Contaminant Specialist with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Laura Burns, Research Conservation Specialist with the Cinnaboyne Park Zoo in Winnipeg, and Melissa Grantham, um, Conservation Biologist with the Nature Conservancy of Canada here in Manitoba. I'd like to thank our speakers for being with us today to talk about the endangered Pauchik Skipperling and their collaborative role in the recovery of this tiny butterfly. Before we begin the webinar, I'd like to quickly cover a few housekeeping topics. As we're being joined by people from across the country, you may experience a temporary glitch during the live stream. We thank you in advance for your patience. Today's webinar is being recorded. We'll be sharing a link to the recording after the event, so keep an eye on your inboxes. We welcome you to revisit the content yourself and share it with colleagues, friends, and family. We want you to join in the conversation and share your thoughts with our online community. Feel free to connect with us through Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram using hashtag NCC Nature Talks during and after the webinar. We also invite your comments and questions. You'll note a Q&A chat box on your screen. If you think of a question for the speakers at any point, just type it in there. Include who the question is intended for, and we'll be answering them at the end of the webinar. The Pau Chic Skipperling is a small grassland butterfly species whose historic range includes southern Manitoba and the Midwestern USA. Species numbers have dropped dramatically in recent years throughout North America. In 2020, fewer than 100 were observed here in Canada. The loss of native prairie habitat has resulted in the dramatic decline of several highly specialized grassland species, including the Pau Chic Skipperling. Today, there are only two small locations where the butterfly can still be found, the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve in Manitoba and the other near Flint, Michigan. Recently, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, also known as the IUCN, included the Pauchik Skipperling on its red list of threatened species. This means it is officially listed as critically endangered. Whether you're talking about polar bears, snow leopards, or tiny grassland butterflies, species extinction is a battle that will only be won if we fight by working together on multiple levels. Thank you for joining us today to learn more about the actions being taken and the people and organizations who are fighting the good fight. At this time, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Sarah Warner, Environmental Contaminant Specialist from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Sarah works on a number of priority initiatives for the conservation of threatened and endangered species. In her current role, Sarah provides technical assistance that is used to analyze the exposure and or risk of contaminants to threatened and endangered species and develops risk minimization strategies. She helps to coordinate the International Pauchik Skipperling Partnership and serves as a co-chair for the science support team and steering committee. Floor is all yours, Sarah. Great, thank you so much, Christine. First off, I wanna thank Nature Conservancy of Canada for inviting me to co-present today. Um, this is really fun to be a part of this. Um, I also wanna just state, so the Fish and Wildlife Service is a government entity that's charged with uh, conservation of endangered species. All of this is under our Endangered Species Act. So we list and we delist and we work to um, prevent species extinctions. 
Um, so with that, I'm going to talk to you today about PowerSheet Skipperling. Um, we'll get into what it is, what it needs, and then what we're doing as a partnership to try to curtail this extinction crisis. So what is a PowerSheet Skipperling? First off, PowerSheet Skipperling is a butterfly. Um, it has very short antennae. You can see here in this picture on the left, has a clubbed antennae. Also has very large uh, black eyes. Some people say that this is a very cute, adorable um, um, butterfly because of these large black eyes. It also, when it's perched and its wings are folded, you can see that it's angled upward. The wings are angled upward. Um, if you take a look at this picture in the upper right, it's a very small, tiny butterfly. Um, and then this picture lower right, you can see its wings are um, outstretched. You can see the really beautiful orange and brown hues that make up the coloration of, of this butterfly. One very apparent feature I want to point out to you is that the veins on the underside of the wing look like they're dusted with white. So this is an important key feature that when we have scientists out in the field do doing surveys, they can actually see those veins that are dusted in white and they know that it's a polycheek skipperling. Okay, so where does a polycheek skipperling live? Uh, these butterflies live in our native prairie habitat. So there are a number of different types of native prairie habitats. Um, the picture on your left is a tall grass prairie. This is one of NCC sites in Manitoba. And then the picture on the right is a prairie fen. This is one of our uh, last remaining sites in the US in Michigan. So you can see these sites do look a little different, but they have some very similar components to them. These are our sites, um, the habitat for Pawashik you wouldn't find in your backyard. So similar, you know, unlike the monarch where you can plant milkweed and nectar resources and attract them to your backyard, you cannot do that for Pawashik. So they're very specialized to unique habitats. Um, and you're going to learn a little bit more about their specific re requirements from Laura. So what does a Pawashik skipperling need? So quickly, we'll talk about the adults and the larva and what they need and what they feed on. So this picture at the top of your screen, you'll see it's an adult Pawashik and it's nectarine. So it's, it's gathering food from flowers, so it needs nectar. Um, some important and shrubby sink foil. So those are important plants for the adults. Now the larva, they don't need the flowers and they don't need the nectar, but what they do is they eat the fine grasses. So they need um, fine grasses that typically grow in clumps. Um, so an example is prairie drop seed, little blue. They also need the dead plant material for shelter um, and safety. When I say dead plant material, this is material that is left over from the growing season. So uh, an example of this, and you can see the bottom picture here. This is a very dedicated scientist searching for Pawashik larvae in the field. So you can see this dead plant material. This is what the site looks like after the, the plants finesse and die for the season. The growing season is over. But looking for a larva is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. I think it's harder. Uh, this picture here, you can zero in on um, the center of this red outlined circle there is a Pawashik skipperling larva right there. So this is very difficult to find the larva. So that's why we um, biologists focus on surveys for uh, the adults. They're easier to see. So this is a map of the upper Midwest. As you can see here, Great Lakes, Mon um, at the light colored area on this map. So this is where native prairie used to exist. So our historic range of native prairie. And you can see that in the red dots, so the red dots are where uh, we used to have historically Pawashik skipperlings. So these are all individual sites. We had approximately 300, just under 300 known sites where they occurred. Now, this is a little hard to see on this map, but if you can see up here in Manitoba, uh, there's a green dot. So that's NCC's Tallgrass Prairie Preserve. This is where they exist now. And then also, if you look at Michigan, this is where they exist. So we have four known prairie fence in Michigan where they exist, and we have one site. We lump all the uh, tall grass prairie uh, the complex preserve into one site. So this is a visual of the population and what's happened over time. And I don't want you to focus really much on the axes. I just want you to see 
the lines and just look at the visual. Um, these individual lines are sites in Michigan where we've been doing surveys. Um, but over the course of the past decade, we have noticed, as you see, a very, very sharp, steep decline for Palashik. And this is similar to what's happening in Canada as well. Um, so as I said earlier, there's less than five sites. Um, what the total population estimate is, it does remain largely unknown, but scientists are thinking that we have under 500 individuals left um, in the world. This is really concerning. This used to be one of the most frequently detected prairie skippers, butterflies in the Midwest. Okay, so potential threats. Um, we have been uh, focusing on and talking a lot about small population size, sizes, um, habitat changes, climate change, disease contaminants, and low genetic diversity. Um, and I have other pictures here of uh, other imper imperiled invertebrates. So in the United States um, and in Canada, we have monarch butterfly in Canada and rusty patch bumblebee in Ontario. What we do for Powashik in these native prairies, it's important to understand that we're also helping other imperiled invertebrates. Um, and, and, and so it's a win, it's really a win-win for all. All right, so quickly, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the people aspect of, of this um, conservation program. So we are a international partnership. We've been together for quite a while, um, a decade, maybe even over a decade. Um, we have a number of different teams, international, teams that are formed to work on various aspects of this large conservation program. And this picture on the right, it was a very, very cold day. We try to get together in person um, before COVID, and now it's all virtual, but we would get together in person and visit the sites, which was really great learning experience for all of us to get to the different sites. So quickly, what are we doing together? We have various aspects of this program. We have zoo-based, zoo Number of zoos are developing rearing strategies to help bolster existing populations. Um, we focus on habitat management, so trying to make the habitat as healthy and viable as we can for Powashiks to exist in. Outreach and education, and we also do quite a lot of um, science and research. So who we are, we are made up of a number of entities. Um, so many, I would have to have multiple slides to get them all on. Um, so many, many uh, government agencies, state agencies, NGOs, um, you name it, they, we are working together. It's a very large part. Um, and my last slide here, I just want to talk very briefly about Fish and Wildlife Service and some of our conservation planning efforts. So we're working um, in concert with a number of different aspects of the partnership programs. But in addition to that, we're working on something we, we refer to as recovery planning. And this is a very similar process to the species at risk planning that Environment and Climate Change Canada partners follow. So similar processes. Basically, it takes science, biological information of Powashik to build a vision or a roadmap for preventing extinction. So we're currently um, in the process of that. Um, and these are some of our fish and wildlife colleagues out in the field um, working uh, with zoos and with our partners at the Powashik sites in Michigan. So my last, lastly, you know, my take home message is uh, we are a team of international partners working together. We're really trying to do all that we can to prevent this extinction. Um, and the Fish and Wildlife Service is so proud to be a part of this effort with our Canadian partners. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Sarah. We really appreciate you providing your insights on the Powashik Skipperling populations and behaviors, habitats, and the international partnership. Our next speaker today is Laura Burns, Research Conservation Specialist at the Assiniboine Park Zoo in Winnipeg. Laura leads the zoo's captive rearing and release program for the endangered Powashik Skipperling butterfly. Since 2018, the zoo team has been releasing Powashik adults back into the wild at NCC's Tall Grass Prairie Natural Area. This year, they successfully bred the butterfly in human care for the first time. I'm also very excited to share that Laura was named one of this year's CBC Manitoba Future 40 Award winners 
that recognizes Manitoba researchers, educators, and scientists who are making a difference not only in Manitoba, but in Canada and around the world. Whenever you're ready, Laura. Thank you, Christine, uh, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, one of my favorite parts of my job is talking to people about Powashik Skipperling, so uh, thank you for this opportunity. So I work for Assiniboine Park Zoo in Winnipeg, but I wanted to start by saying that we're not the only zoo involved in this project. Uh, the Minnesota Zoo we've been closely working with for a few years now, and they've helped develop um, the protocols for this program. And recently, really excitingly, the John Ball Zoo in Michigan has also come on board. So there are three zoos working on this project. So to start, when a zoo wants to get involved in um, a conservation program, they have to look at the life cycle of an animal and figure out where they can help. So I'm gonna go through the life cycle of a powashik with you right now. Now, if you can all just think back to when you were in elementary school and learning the life cycle of a butterfly, that's the same thing powashik does. So egg, caterpillar, chrysalis, adult. And I'm going to show you how that maps to a year in the life of a powashik. In the summertime, there are adults flying in the prairie, mating and laying eggs. And those eggs hatch into caterpillars that summer. Those caterpillars will grow through the summer and fall. And then instead of migrating like some butterflies, they'll actually spend the whole time underneath the snow, frozen solid for about five to six months. They're very hardy uh, Midwester. <laughs> In the springtime, the caterpillars wake up, they'll continue eating grasses and growing, and then they'll reach that final stage before adulthood, the chrysalis, where they go through metamorphosis. So important to note here is that powashik go through one full life cycle per year. There's no overlapping generations, so there's a complete turnover in the population once a year. Now, when we look at this life cycle, we have to figure out where we can make the biggest difference in their survival. So some zoo programs um, will breed animals in captivity and rear them through their whole lives and create sort of an insurance population. How we wanted to start it with Powashik was a little bit less risky than that. So we wanted to identify a certain life stage where we could increase survival the most. And for Powashik, we determined that was this whole section. So essentially the whole time they're a caterpillar is when they're most susceptible um, to threats. And that's where we thought we could increase their survival. So when you take an animal out of the wild for a brief period of time to give it a better chance at survival and then put it back into the wild to contribute to the population, that's called head starting. You're giving that animal a head start at life in order for it to contribute to the wild population. So that's what we've been working on most recently with Powashik. Now I'm going to show you how we do that. How do we actually increase the survival rate? of the species when we take care of it at the zoo. So to start, we go out into the field when adults are flying and catch a few females for egg collection. We hold them for three days and put them back into the wild, but we keep the eggs they lay. Now, there's an egg in that photo there on the right. They're very tiny, it's on a single blade of grass. And we take those eggs and put them in an incubator, hold them at constant temperature and humidity in order to increase the hatch rate. Then once they hatch, they hatch into these tiny caterpillars that are less than two millimeters long. They each get their own individual potted native prairie grass to live on and eat. And those grasses are actually covered to protect them with a highly technical fabric of knee-high pantyhose. <laughs> so one of our summer students in this photo is actually doing a health checkup on Powashik. Uh, he is looking for the caterpillar on the grass, um, and this is how they hang out for the whole summer and into the fall. Now, to emulate um, overwintering, we don't put them outside like they would in the prairie, um, but we actually have a special incubator for them where we hold them at minus four degrees Celsius for about six months. So this constant temperature removes those fluctuations in winter temperature that we think can lead to lower survival over winter. So we can get close to 100% survival over winter using this method. Now in the spring, they wake up, we put them back onto those protected grasses with the netting on top so predators um, can't get to them. 
and then they turn into their chrysalis at the zoo. So if you can't see in this photo, I'll outline it for you. Um, that's what the chrysalis looks like. And just like the caterpillar stage, they are extremely good at camouflage, um, much to the chagrin of our summer team who does no health checkups on them. Uh, power sheep don't really have a lot of other defense mechanisms, so that is why they are such excellent uh, camouflagers. So when they become chrysalises, that's when we take them back out into the wild. So this is a picture at NCC's Tallgrass Prairie Preserve, and that there you can see is a release chamber that actually the Minnesota Zoo staff built for us and shipped up. They have mesh sides, and we put the grasses and pupa or chrysalises in there to acclimate to the site in a protected way. From there, we actually do several checks on them a day, and when an adult emerges from its chrysalis, we release it. So here's a picture of me releasing a power sheik last year uh, in the site. I'll zoom in there because they're so small. And in case you can't see it, I'll just add this arrow too. They're a very small butterfly. Um, and it's very exciting to release them every year. So since 2018, we have released 38 power sheik back into the wild in Canada. And that may not sound like a lot, but as Sarah said, we're looking at very small population sizes that are left in the wild. So really this could represent a huge portion of the population that's left. And finally, as Christine mentioned when she was introducing me, we successfully bred Powashik for the first time at the zoo this summer. Um, this had never been done before and it's a huge step forward in their conservation. So what you're looking at here is a bit of a risque photo <laughs> of two Powashik breeding at the zoo. Um, when we normally catch females in the wild, we aren't sure if they have bred, and that can lead to low egg numbers or low egg hatching rates. So by ensuring that they have bred, we can potentially produce many more Powashik at the zoo in human care to release into the wild and potentially reintroduce them to sites where they've been lost. So with that, I want to thank some of our recent funders and all the amazing partners we work with. And I'm happy to answer your questions at the end. Thank you, Laura. We're, we're really grateful for your time today and for sharing your expertise in the Pau Sheep life cycle and what zoos are doing to aid in their survival. It's such great work. Our final speaker today is Melissa Grantham, conservation biologist at the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Melissa has been working for NCC in Manitoba since 2013. She works in both science and stewardship on a wide variety of projects. Melissa plays an integral role in leading and coordinating numerous species at risk initiatives, including development of multi-species at risk plans and coordinating monitoring and research projects. She also coordinates numerous Canadian and international partners on the recovery of the Pau Sheik Skipperling. In conservation lingo, species at risk are often referred to as SAR, which makes Melissa NCC SAR superstar. Take it away, Melissa. Thanks very much, Christine. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here this afternoon to talk to you about this wonderful little butterfly and especially in the company of Sarah and Laura, who are two really great partners that I love working with. So earlier you heard uh, a little bit from Sarah about the international partnership. Well, here in Canada, uh, based out of Manitoba, we also work together through the Canadian Powashik Recovery Group. So we're made up of six partner organizations. There's uh, us, the Nature Conservancy of Canada, Agriculture, uh, Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development, the University of Winnipeg, Assiniboine Park Zoo, the Living Prairie Museum here in Winnipeg, as well as Environment and Climate Change Canada. Um, so we do have a really good uh, variety of representation from different groups. Uh, we've got federal and provincial government agencies, academic and research institutions, as well as nonprofit organizations. So this group came together, um, I guess officially uh, back in 2017, through a shared recognition of range-wide species needs, as well as a shared interest in species recovery and conservation. We all saw a need for consistency over time in working towards their recovery and recognized that somebody needed to step up and together we do have the capacity to do that. 
So it's really important to note here too that although we do focus on our Manitoba population, we're really strongly linked to and work really closely with the international partnership on many different kinds of initiatives. So a big part of NCC's mission is to conserve important natural areas and biological diversity here in Canada. And this is why we work to protect habitats like endangered grasslands and the species that depend on them like Powshik Skipperling. And in keeping with that mission, our approach to helping uh, Powshik is one of collaboration. So working together with our partners and recognizing where others aside from us have really valuable expertise and adaptive management. So that's where we're continually coming back together to assess um, or look at what we've learned and what we've accomplished and to incorporate that knowledge back into our approach moving forward. So NCC has been working on uh, Power Sheet going back to around 2012. Um, and currently we are uh, leading on coordinating the Canadian efforts among all the partners. So as a group, we work together and within each organization's strengths. So although we engage in uh, partnership-wide discussions and decision-making, each organization is also still responsible for its own priorities. And another key piece of working together is, is strategic planning. So what I mean by that is, is all partners working together, willing to share expertise, experiences, um, resources, methods to help uh, our recovery initiatives moving forward. So like planning for the next field season and developing uh, a long-term conservation strategy, which is actually something we're working through right now. Other key initiatives um, that we work on include joint fundraising and communications. These are activities that are really key for us to help uh, raise awareness about the species. So what are NCC and our partners doing to help uh, Powashik Skipperling? Well, we tackle a pretty wide variety of recovery initiatives, some of which you've already heard about from Sarah and from Laura. And these are all aimed at making progress towards species recovery goals and objectives. So one of the things that we do every year is that we carry out uh, population surveys down at the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve, which as you've heard is the only known uh, location of the species in Canada. So these surveys um, are carried out on foot and by different uh, conservation partners, depending on the year. Um, and they're aimed at monitoring the year-to-year -year presence uh, or absence of known populations throughout the preserve. And also in the hopes of finding new pockets of Powashik. Uh, we're always, always hopeful and, and once in a while successful. Um, <laughs> we also survey areas that have been determined to potentially have some of the habitat that is um, suitable for them. And in combination with these surveys, uh, Assiniboine Park Zoo is also leading on some additional surveys that collect more detailed information. So this is information that's not collected in those um, presence or absence population surveys. And these particular uh, surveys are aimed at estimating um, the population size of Powashik. Uh, and this is really helpful information that can be used to help us determine whether or not our conservation efforts are helping. And it helps us monitor the population. And in recognition that in order to conserve species, we also need to conserve the habitats on which they depend, habitat management is a really important component of Powashik recovery. So some of the management activities that we carry out at the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve um, are activities that we do in partnership with local producers and with landowners. And some of these uh, include haying and prescribed grazing. We have also uh, uh, pretty recently implemented a uh, what we call a brush control program uh, in and around Powashik sites and this helps us to control uh, woody encroachment to improve habitat and to create areas of connectivity between patches of suitable habitat for Powashik. And really without active and regular management the, these prairie sites are at risk of becoming not only overgrown with shrub and forest but are also at risk of the subsequent loss of important biodiversity and suitability for Powashik. NCC also um, under land management has a prescribed fire program in place and this past uh, year for the very first time we were uh, able to successfully implement a prescribed fire in small patches of habitat within Powashik sites. And these were um, carried out in areas adjacent to those areas that we know are being used by the butterflies. And all of these land management activities combined are really key for maintaining the integrity of these types of disturbance driven habitats, not only for Powashik, but for the many other species that live there. Another one of the key pieces that goes hand in hand with our on the ground action and was mentioned earlier by Sarah is research. 
So we've been working over the past few years uh, to identify those priority research needs and to work with our partners to get those needs met. So some of our recent research has been focused on understanding the decline and continuing threats, the life stages, so especially the larval or caterpillar stages and what some of their needs are. Um, as you can see, uh, they're really difficult to find in the field, so programs like uh, those that are carried out at the zoo are really critical, um, as well as addressing gaps in our knowledge. And uh, one of the ways that we're also able to bring uh, sort of awareness about Pow Chic and, and to reach out to additional partners or potential partners is by collaborating together on public engagement, on fundraising and on education. So this includes, you know, inside the classrooms, uh, news, newspaper articles, radio interviews, um, social media posts and webinars just like this one. All of the work that we've done to date really gives us some accomplishments to be proud of. But to be honest, we've also had and do continue to have some challenges along the way. So some of these challenges include, you know, working across borders and overcoming geographical differences, um, funding sources, you know, sometimes they're, they're not going to cover the work that we need to do over several years in a row. Um, and sometimes even initiating changes within the partnership and taking on new directions can be challenging. But as a partnership, we're working uh, to acknowledge, we're working hard to acknowledge and to address those challenges and to ensure that every, uh, everyone's voices are heard. To help um, our, guide our path forward uh, in the partnership, we're, we're investigating and implementing new initiatives and approaches, uh, such as changes um, to our in-person meeting structure and goals. So for example, this year, we had to shift our in-person meeting to this virtual format. Um, which is not always ideal for the things we want to accomplish, but you know, we have to do the best with what we have. Uh, and moving forward, we are going to continue to learn from our work and from each other. That's sort of one of our key, our key pieces of moving forward. Um, and one of the big questions that we do need to ask ourselves is, is it worth it? Is this approach working towards the conservation of the species? And I feel really strongly that yes, it is, and that we really are a stronger force for Power Chic together as a partnership than we are as individual organizations. And finally, I really wanted to emphasize what a hugely collaborative effort this is. There are lots of really great people involved and we have some wonderful funders helping us along the way. And I want to make sure that they get a really big thank you. And uh, I also wanted to thank, uh, thank you for listening today and for the opportunity to speak to you all about Power Chic. Thank you, Melissa, for sharing your, with us your experience with the Canadian team and links to the international partnership, as well as the conservation efforts being made at NCC. We have several questions that have been submitted by the audience, so thank you very much, everybody. As a reminder, if you have a question that you would have not yet submitted, please enter it using the Q&A chat box feature. Let us know who the question is for and we'll get through as many as time allows. So here is our first question. Uh, what is the significance of the name Pau Chic and what does the name mean? Anybody? Yeah, I can try to answer that and then Laura, Melissa can jump in too. Um, but quickly, you know, Pau Chic, a lot of folks um, pronounce it power chic, but it is power chic. <laughs> and power chic is actually a county in Iowa um, in the United States. And that county was named after Chief Power Chic. So it has indigenous Native American roots. Uh, Chief Power Chic is uh, known for signing the treaty that ended the Black Hawk War. So I believe that's where its roots are. And Laura and Melissa, you can confirm that or <laughs> correct me. Great question. I think uh, I think we'll take silence as agreement. So that's great. Thank you. Uh, next question: Why the precipitous decline, particularly in the past decade or so? After all, we've been losing tall grass prairies on the continent for many decades. Laura, do you want to take this one? Um, I could, although I think Sarah might be the best person to answer this as a Even U.S. Better. Fish and Wildlife rep. <laughs> Even better. Sure. Uh, 
Sure. Well, I'll give a shot and then Laura and Melissa can jump in here. So yes, we have been losing prairie ecosystems. Um, we have a uh, very low percentage, right? 1% uh, prairie, I'm just throwing that number out, but we have lost a, a lot of our um, high quality remnant prairies. And uh, so why the power cheek decline? I think we're still trying to wrap our minds around that. So we know there are many variables that likely contributed to the decline. We don't think it's just one variable or one cause, likely many different variables acting in concert with each other um, that ha has uh, impacted the, the decline. So uh, a number of things. So we've talked as a partnership a lot about changes in the environment. So climate change, are we still seeing um, the hard packed snow? So I think Laura, we maybe Laura can talk about this too, but the larva need a, a very special environment to survive the winter and snowpack is very important. So the microclimate um, of that snowpack in between that uh, snow layer and the, and the ground is important. So have temperatures changed, have humidity changed? Um, so climate change variables, um, we've talked a lot about uh, changes in land use. So how are we managing prairies? What about the landscape surrounding prairies? Um, could it be environmental contaminants? Um, uh, what about disease? So these, I'm just throwing out some variables that could, really could be working in concert with each other that influence this decline. Uh, it's a great question. We have so much to learn. Thank you. Uh, Laura or Melissa, anything to add? I think Sarah covered it really well. Um, and an important thing to note is that the partnership is actively working to try to figure out a lot of those questions. So we're spearheading research to try and address what happened, you know, about 20 years ago that changed. Um, yeah. So hopefully we'll have a better answer soon. <laughs> Great. Uh, Melissa, I'll, I'll put this one over to you. Are the Pausheek Skipperling legally protected in Canada? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, they're actually protected at two different levels. So they are protected here in Manitoba under uh, Manitoba's Endangered Species and Ecosystems Act. And they're also protect protected federally under, the, um, under Canada's Species at Risk Act. Great, thank you. Joanna says, uh, I'm almost convinced I am visited by this butterfly in my Edmonton, Alberta garden annually. How do I go about reporting for verification? Um, I can take that one. Um, I often get questions from people like this that think they've seen Powashik somewhere. Um, and that's very exciting. However, like Sarah said in her presentation, Powashik are very restricted to the type of habitat they use. So um, in Alberta, we don't really see that sort of tall grass prairie or prairie fen habitat that they really rely on. So it's pretty unlikely that they'd be found in Alberta. Um, there are a lot of skipper and skipperlings that look very similar to Powashik. So it's very easy to mix them up um, if you see them briefly. However, if you ever do see a species that you think is um, of note or you want confirmation, I always suggest a really great resource in iNaturalist. So it's an app or a website that you can upload sightings of wildlife onto. And then there's actually species experts across the world that can help you identify it. And then the really great thing about it is that species experts use it to look for ranges. So people like me and the people in the Powashik team can actually go on iNaturalist and see where power sheep have been observed and we could go investigate it. So if you want a confirmation, that's what I would suggest. Great, thanks. Uh, are the power sheep related to the rare Ontario Greta skipper? Mel, do you want to take that one? Hi there, sorry, <laughs> sorry about the delay there. Um, yes, they, they are related. Um, I, <laughs> I honestly, 
uh, don't recall, um, I believe they're in the same genus. Um, I can answer or, the question. Yeah, maybe Laura's want. a better person to answer that one. Sorry. Yeah. Nope, that's perfect. Um, Thanks, Laura. Yeah, so Garita skipperling uh, is in the same genus, just like Melissa said. <laughs> You're right. Um, they're considered sister species, so they're very closely related to each other. Um, Garita skipperling are much more widely distributed than Pawashik, um, and we're not 100% sure what's happening with their populations, but they do seem to be doing much better than Pawashik. Um, and they're actually so closely related that um, our zoo and the Minnesota Zoo have actually been raising them um, in human care for the past few years in order to help us um, determine the best way to raise Pawashik because they're so similar. Uh, we can actually raise Garita um, in different situations to figure out what works best for Pawashik without risking um, testing things on a very, very endangered species. So yeah, they're very closely related. Great, I think this one might be yours too. Laura, how do you recognize a female versus male Pawashik? I can answer that. <laughs> Uh, so there are very subtle differences um, and you usually have to see them quite close up to tell, but there's a few key characteristics. Uh, most butterflies, one way to tell is looking at their abdomen. So that um, long end part of their body, that is where females store eggs. So they have to be much bigger than the males. So if you look at an abdomen of a male butterfly, it's usually quite skinny and usually has little tufts on the end, which are claspers for mating. And female um, abdomens are very round and full looking uh, because they're carrying all the eggs. And with Pawashik, one extra way to tell is to look at their antennae. So male antennae are almost pure yellow and females are annulated. So that means they look like they have little rings going up the antennae all the way that are brown. So if you can get close enough to see the antenna, you can usually uh, make an educated guess. Wow, there you go. Uh, one last question here from John. Are there many suitable areas in the US and Canada for this butterfly that are presently unpopulated with the pow chic? So perhaps Sarah and, and Melissa, if you could take those. Sure, thanks, Christine. Um, yeah, so here in, in Manitoba, um, I, I would say that there aren't very many places uh, that are currently unoccupied that would be suitable. Um, we have been working towards um, identifying some of these areas. Uh, some of our partners at the University of Winnipeg have been working on something um, called a habitat suitability model. So it takes a variety of different, um, different kinds of features in the landscape like soil health and, and moisture levels and vegetation, like the presence of different kinds of vegetation. And it puts it all together in a model that can help us predict where those pieces of suitable habitat might be. Um, and one of the other tools that we use is um, uh, sort of satellite imagery. So when we're planning our surveys every year, uh, we do look at that satellite imagery along with um, other data that NCC has collected on the ground to determine places where we think they might be. And we do try to add those into our surveys every year, uh, looking around at different places. Um, but really, we're, it's sort of the species has always been restricted to southeastern Manitoba. Um, I don't I don't believe um, that it sort of had a range that expanded much beyond that. So we're sort of st still kind of keeping to that sort of southeastern portion of the province um, as areas where they where they might be. Uh, up, up a little bit further north in the preserve, I would say, but um, but still kind of in that southeastern region. Yeah, and, and I think this is a great question. It's a question that we talk um, about so much in the partnership. So I'll just echo some of the things that Melissa said um, in the United States. Um, you know, we are looking at other areas that we think could be suitable. So we are working with our colleagues um, at Central Michigan University and Michigan Natural Features Inventory to look at other prairie fens um, and prairie habitats in Michigan that could be suitable, where uh, currently we're not detecting any Pawashik. Um, but also, I just want to say a couple, two more comments about this. One, we're still learning quite a lot about what suitable habitat means and what, um, what it means and what is ideal for Pawashik. Um, so we have a lot to learn about its life history and what it 
still, we've learned so much um, to date. Secondly, um, that map that I showed you that had just the two green areas, tall grass, prairie preserve, and Michigan prairie fens, um, we still would like to continue to look in North Dakota and South Dakota and Minnesota and other areas and to conduct more thorough. Are there any remnant populations out there that we haven't found? And that's a question that the partnership um, would like to move forward on is, is really taking a look at, you know, where could they be in conducting uh, large uh, efforts and survey. Well, that's exciting. We can have another webinar coming then. <laughs> so unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions today. If we didn't get to your questions or you have something else you'd like to ask any of our panelists, please just reach out to us at events at natureconservancy.ca and we will happily pass those along to them. Thank you to everyone who joined us for today's webinar, to Sarah, Laura, and Melissa. Thank you so much for sharing your insight and expertise. For further information on POW sheep recovery efforts, we'll see two QR codes on your screen there. Please visit either of these websites and you'll find all the information you're looking for. Stay tuned for the link to today's webinar recording. You'll receive that in our follow-up email within the next 24 hours. On behalf of the Nature Conservancy of Canada and our wonderful partners who have joined us here today, thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful rest of you, your day. We hope to see you next time.